like to do that please for signed online please try to for like okay thank you so when we visited the cornell university that time uh, as one of the in program on cornell cnau dual degree program so when we visited then there is a, there are a lot of nobel laureates uh, cornell university and it, it's not a one discipline sometimes uh, chemist will be there sometimes uh, uh, medical side people will be there sometimes even we are uh, people from different walks of life they feel the campus so that time they used to try to arrange a lecture uh, all different kind of way but they, they arrange the lecture so we have the opportunity i maybe could discuss that uh, the thing is that they go digitally they have the they document every lectures a yeah, coffee table book that this is so that time we don't know they put a small the whole lectures in a clips in a video clips and record and put it in their uh, in their server the cornell server and people later those who are not able to occupy some of the other works or some meetings sometimes initially watch those and the, so the people again uh, different field uh, people variety of people it's not a specific but the different domains the people the reason why when you when you hear the lecture from entirely of your domain yes different perception on your research and different forward so this the cross disciplinary learning one be happen out of classroom area where this kind of one lectures we learn we learn a lot that's why our vice chancellor is very particular on all our students all our masters especially masters and doctoral students has to watch a different kind of uh, lectures either astronomy or psychology or whatever may be all, all our students all our masters especially masters and doctoral students watch here yeah, kind of in astronomy or whatever baby all the online have to be patient so yeah, please again i request all the online first please keep so the thing is that when when the different discipline here sometimes you may ask the question guys are why should i attend the pathology lecture by by the not like that so they have their own way of designing the experiment their own way of conducting the experiment the, the way in which they protect their result and how they publish in a very quality journal how they different sometimes one particular research area many people act and contribute something and make it a big paper all things is very uh, that's why when we uh, learn this kind of cross discipline lectures and journals so what after uh, why not this happen in india why not in tamil nadu yes it is happening we also have the variety of speakers here and also we recorded those uh, microsoft team and it also sometime we may have the videos are available in the youtube live screening those things is how happening because india has past 15 years very largely and they have very very different size are there also there we have professors in this as so i want all my graduate students get benefited from this lecture so with this uh, this small note on the introductory note i really thank the uh, agriculture college trichy the speaker and really it's a good initiative it's outside campus and yeah this a wonderful afternoon we'll we'll like to share the lectures uh, thank you um, for providing me the opportunity to talk to you the your the on the online academic hall and also connected online various campuses thank you one and all uh, now the stage to anir rajan sir
May I audible? Yes, yes, audible, please. So good afternoon to one and all. So those who are joined in uh, online and offline. I am uh, very much indebted to thank our TNA Vice Chancellor for providing this uh, PG Endowment Lecture, Entomology, to ADS Sendari Trichy. Also, I am um, so very much thankful to so Dr. Sendil, Dean Postgraduate Studies and Director of Center for Plant Molecular Biology for his uh, speedy action and a quick decision in finalization of topics allotted to ADS Sendari Trichy. I also thank to Office of the Postgraduate Dean, the staff of PGD in, uh, office for them to for a smooth conduct of this program. I'm also thankful to the Dean Hedsindari women for providing the facilities. And now it's my duty to introduce the speaker of this uh, session. So Dr. Subramanian. Yes, uh, Subramanian. He is now as a principal scientist and head division of entomology, Indian Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi. A brief introduction about him. He is from uh, Trichy. He studied his uh, school studies at Trichy and uh, joined BS Agri program at TNAU Madurai. Then he appeared for ICR JRF Fellowship Entomology. He got the ICR JRF, but he didn't get seat at TNAU. Instead, he got only plant breeding and genetics at uh, TNAU. So he got a seat in Anomaly University for entomology. So because of the subject entomology, uh, he left the TNAU and joined Anomaly University for uh, studying the entomology. So there he studiously studied and appeared for IR in New Delhi and got the PhD seat. During 1994, he has completed. Then he joined uh, at Metapalayam. FC and RA as uh, SRF. Then he appeared for ARS examination also. He got the scientist post, but at the same time he got the uh, assistant post at TNAU. He joined at Cotton Research Station, Sri Viliputur. Then he continued his uh, service at uh, Sugarcane Research Station, TNAU, Sirigamani, and then TNAU, Department of Sericulture. Then during that period, uh, 2009, he did his uh, postdoctoral fellow in Oxford University, UK, in the area of molecular entomology. Then during the year 2010, he made a decision to leave uh, TNAU and joined as a principal scientist in division of entomology, IRI, New Delhi. So he got various schemes in uh, DST, ICR, NASF, and National B Board. He is expertised in molecular entomology. He has many research articles. Um, he has guided many students and now he is elevated as a head in the division of entomology, IRA New Delhi. He also has a scheme, uh, international scheme with Australia in collaboration with the TNA. And uh, besides that, he is a voracious uh, reader and um, he has written many books also. And um, he has a skill to edit the language. So now, uh, Samora so is my classmate also, undergraduate. So with this introduction, I request uh, Dr. S. Subramanian to present the topic on genomic approaches for insect pest management. So genomic approaches is nowadays a, a novel one, gene by gene approach for insect pest management instead of conventional. Uh, it is very new to us in case of uh, entomology. So now I request uh, Subramanian to have his lecture. So this is a campus which you have connected, Kiligulam, Koyambutur, Trichy and Madurai. And um, the time allotted is uh, till 3.30 p.m. And now the time is uh, 2.20. So we have to go for interaction also. So request the speaker to restrict the time within uh, three hours, 15 minutes, so that you'll have the interaction, followed by another lecture is also there at AC and Dari Madurai. Thank you. I request uh, Dr. Ambedkar, uh, head entomology, to welcome the speaker. Uh, to welcome the, the guest speaker. Yeah. Go this way. 
good afternoon to Ananda. Yeah, so uh, thanks. Yeah. I welcome Dr. Shikramayam. Principal science and head of division of entomology IR in the building for this endowment. Uh, welcome, yeah. sir. Thank you. 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 Good afternoon, Tom. Am I audible and uh, whether the slides are visible, Sanjay? Sir, is it not? Sir, uh, audible, sir. In Coimbatore. Slides are visible. Okay, good afternoon to one and all. It's been uh, indeed a proud moment to talk before my alma mater, and the grand opportunity is provided in the form of TNAU School of PGA, PG Studies Endowment Lecture, the grand initiative by Dr. S. Geeta Lakshmi, Vice Chancellor of TNAU, and Dr. Santil Nadesan, Team PGS, for really a great opportunity for connecting audience across the campuses in the form of uh, endowment lectures. So I'm really overwhelmed by offering me the opportunity for delivering you. So for all the, my dear scientist colleagues here, and also who have joined uh, through online in different campuses, and also other delegates who are joining this lecture through the online platform, a warm good afternoon to everybody. So today I will be delivering a topic called the genomic approaches for insect pest management. So it's a brief overview of my lecture. It's just we will be covering on the a brief introduction on insect genomics. So what are the different molecular approaches in IPM? The different databases and how. The applied entomology, these techniques can be used for a sustainable pest management. And also other corollary part of this uh, one, I will also be covering on the microbiome on the way ahead. Insect pest management is really a puzzling one. As goes the diversity crops and goes the diversity of the insects, the same medicine cannot be given for all crops for all, not all pests. There are different strategies of the either physical, chemical, cultural, biological. It varies with the crop to crop or but we should all coordinate in a coordinated manner. And that comes the concept of, earlier it's called by the term integrated pest management, pioneered by none other than Dr. S. J. Raj, former vice chancellor of TNI in a grand way by introduction of the Nuclear polyhydrosis virus based control for the pests in different crops 
and also the grand initiative from TNIO in the form of introducing the concepts of IPM and scientists of TNIO have taken the nation in a lead in introducing the concepts of IPM in many crops. In collaboration with the IRI, the rice IPM was promoted in a big way in the country in Tamil Nadu and that started with the initial work from a pioneer group, TNA and other institutes. There is an exclusive institute called NCIPM and National Center for Insect Pest Management at Delhi. And now the IPM has gone in a big way and it is practiced. Some of the success stories are really proud to be. Like when there is a new invasive pest called Papaya Bailibug invaded the country and caused economic havoc and the IPM strategy exclusive that biological control came handy and there again with the collaboration from ICR, NBIR Institute and TNAO, the parasites were introduced, the exotic parasites keep the pests under control. And our recent success is the management of the Spodococca frugiperta. Here again, the network of uh, institutes and also the scientists' collaboration across the country have added a good results. It's all we can say there are proud moments for IPM. But like we are changing the mobile sets every now and often, our technologies also have to be refined. What we heard the mobile in 2004, no longer we can have it, it's an obsolete. Similarly, in every field, if we go, the technology is uh, changing fast and we have to adapt to that technology. IPM is no exception. Here again, we have to embrace the technologies in the form of molecular and genomic approaches. So the molecular entomology has made a significant impact in the field of agriculture and entomology, pharmaceutical and medical entomology for over, well over 20 decades, two, two decades. For more than 20 years, these concepts have been around and worldwide it has been practiced in different forms. Some of these initiatives uh, have really uh, made a big wonder like uh, I5K, I'll be explaining some later <coughs> on. All these are possible because of the development of the next generation genomic tools and others. Say earlier for the crop management, especially for the crop protection, the earlier approach was actually the host plant resistance. It is one of the sure shot success we have been relying on, introducing the resistant plants to replace the susceptible plants. So by identifying the factors which may be inimical for the insects and also the plant can have a better defense, resistant cultivars have been developed. When investigations are going on for factors associated with the resistance to the insect pests, in different crops, number of works have been done. They also identified the genes associated with the pest resistance. So in the rice genome, likewise, there have been identification of the different genes which have been associated with the BPS resistance. As on date, more than 24 genes have been identified. And these concepts have been, they have been identified from the different type donor varieties of the rice and using these different molecular markers aided breeding have revolutionized the management in the form of developing a stable resistant varieties. Here again, the better understanding of the insect pest as well as the crop phenology as well as the genotype of the crops have given a good results in developing a better resistant varieties and here again the molecular tools have not only proved handy in developing improved varieties, but also varieties which are resistant to insect pests. The molecular markers are not only used in crop breeding, there are in many ways they are used. One of the important way is barcodes. Whoever visited a supermarket or any mall these days, or even in a small shopkeeper, you are all familiar with the barcode. When a product is taken, a small barcode is there and the barcode is scanned. The moment it goes to the cashier or counter, it will, can be decoded and the price will be automatically entered in the computer. Same way, there is a strategy for developing a barcode for insects. Instead of a small barcode, it's a molecular barcode. So with uh, exploiting the phenomenon that mitochondrial 
cytochrome oxidase bond gene has been conserved and this phenomenon has been exploited for using it as a molecular barcode. So the barcodes have been developed for different insect pests and these techniques have been used for developing a barcode for insects. One grand utility for this barcode developing it, whenever there is an invasive pest or that, everywhere the workers or the entomologists who are working may not be familiar with the pest, the taxonomist may not be available. When the barcode of the pest is ready, simply by taking the DNA from the insects, invasive pests or anything unknown insects, we can do the barcoding and with this barcoding, when it is uh, referred with the NCBI database, it can easily be deferred that it is a product of Rugiperda or any other invasive pest. This barcoding technique has proved success, especially in the case of invasive pests. The invasive pests have the ability to expand the areas in a short time. So during the short time, it's very difficult whether it is a devastating invasive pest or the local dummy pest. For these reasons, the better understanding of the pest, especially the techniques like barcodes have come handy. Similarly, the barcodes can be used for identifying the population structures of the insects. Many works have been done in uh, many different parts of the country and uh, thereby they have identified the population structure of honeybee population or other bee population. Similarly, for the phylogenetic variations, say, this is an another tool, phylogeny. How the genes of particular uh, insect species, when they are compared with the populations, they can be linked. So on the variation, are that the populations are genetically different or not, it can be easily identified through the phylogenetic analysis. So through the phylogenetic analysis, we identified there are population structure variations in many different pests. Yes, whether it is a Podophora frugiperda or Helica verpa or Heliates, Tobacco, uh, Bobum, many cases, it has proved handy this kind of studies. With the collaboration from the TNAU and uh, IRA and uh, many other institutes, we had a grand challenge program. In the Indo Australian grand challenge program, we have done the phylogenetic analysis for the major T pests and compared with the Australian population. And our studies show that Indian populations are unique and their distribution strikingly different from that of on the Australian one. And these information can help devising a better management strategies. So with this help of barcodes, we can identify whether it is a, a B, C, or D, or A, anything. Only when larva is available, we can take the DNA from the insects, do the studies with the barcoding, with the MTCO one markers, and the applicants can be sequenced and the available sequence when it is uh, matched with the NCBI database, we can very easily identify what is this pest A, B, C, or D. Anything now the molecular barcoding has really revolutionized the pest identification. So a number of pioneering works have been taken up with entomologists like Mohan Kumar, Balasubramanian, Mars Universal, Murugan, and they have actually worked uh, on characterizing the many different species, barcoding of the insects, or developing the disease diagnostics for honeybees, or the BT strain variations. So in many different cases, the same principles of barcoding or fingerprinting can be used. This is a one case, how this fundamental information can be incorporated to identify whether it is an invasive pest or whether the population structure is variant. And this information is very fundamental for developing our IPM concepts. In our laboratory, in collaboration with the other teams, we actually characterize the white fly genetic groups. Earlier it was referred to as the biotype. Our team actually worked in collaboration with our other partners at Delhi University and the IIHR. We actually developed the genetic group map of white flies. And our studies show that there are 11 biotypes or genetic groups in India among the 19 in Asia. And these studies actually tell them the variations in the biotype study or the biotype profile. And it also helps what is the status of the insecticide resistance. And we have brought out there are distinct variations in the different genetic groups which always their insecticide resistance status. By knowing these information, we can incorporate in the pest control strategies. When the insects are known to show resistance to a particular group of insecticides, we can go for alternate insecticides. 
For this insecticide resistance studies also, we use the molecular markers in a big way. So say, for example, the fumigant phosphine, due to the continuous and uh, overuse of this uh, fumigant, the reports are shown that uh, most of these fruit grain pests have developed resistance. The grand challenge program uh, with a big team of uh, scientists from IRA, TNAU, CFTRA, and others, we could do the population mapping for more than 200 population of the tribolium as well as for the 187 population of the rice of the Dominica or the lesser grain borer. We developed a calf marker. With this calf marker, we could very easily develop using this genotyping profile whether there is a strong resistance. One single band, it is a denoter of the strong resistance. This is a heterozygous, and these bands are there means that it is a susceptible one. So likewise, using the specific marker for phosphate resistance for a particular gene called uh, right, RPX2 or uh, in the form of uh, DLD gene it's called. Using this, we develop the marker and this marker has come handy for checking any population, whether the particular population has developed strong resistance to phosphate or not. Once this information is obtained, the same data can be taken to the storage godown. When the particular population is showing a strong resistance, there is a need for devising the fumigation strategies. Instead of increasing the fumigation dose, we can extend the fumigation period. So by that way, by extended fumigation period and the fumigation strategy, then particular location that the pest can be controlled. So these are the one of the example how the molecular data can be integrated into the field data for devising the better management strategies. Similarly, in many of these uh, storage goodons, they use uh, gentrometrin for as a contact insecticide. Again, the studies from the ASR of conditions may have found that they are showing their resistance to the pyrethroid. By analysis of the voltage gated sodium channel, and we found out there is a decisive mutation. One nucleotides that are coding for threonine, one single mutation is converted into ACC into AUC. In terms of the functional expression, threonine is converted into isoleucine. So this particular mutation, threonine into isoleucine at the 929 site of the voltage gated sodium channel in the cytoplasm varese. Let's call it as a KDR. One single mutation makes this insect or the population thousandfold resistance when compared to the susceptible. So by simply using this kind of a marker studies by identifying these facts, a specific marker can be developed using this PCR RFLT technique. And this marker can be used by assessing any population there is no need for conducting the systematic toxicological investigations. By simply doing this kind of studies, we can have the first hand information whether this particular population is resistant to pyrethroid or not. That information will be handy so that we can forego the use of that insecticide. Another great revolution, whenever we say the molecular tool, which I made a big way, there is no greater proof than Vt cotton. When it was introduced in 2002, it was viewed with a skepticism in the country. But see the data, actually data proves over the years, the level of production, now as on date, it is 96%. 96% of the cotton grown in the country is only BT cotton. Same way, the yield levels also have increased over the years. Any single reason, earlier the <laughs> cotton was actually devastated by bollworms. And for these bollworms, they have been using the excess of insecticides. This excess use of insecticides also caused the problem of insecticide resistance development. At the same time, we are not getting the sustainable yields. Ever since we started using the adoption of the Bt cotton, there was a reduction in the usage of the insecticides, as well as there is also an Increase in yield of cotton over the years. Now the yield levels have almost stabilized. It's altogether different stories. Once bollworms have uh, been out of the scene, that other sucking pests are come. Again, we have to find some other alternate strategies to manage them. No longer the bollworms are seen, especially except the pink bollworm, 
most of the bone lungs are not a major place in cotton. Almost Hilika of Ahamijara, at one time, there are international workshops exclusively for the, this bone worm. That work, Heliathis Congress, one, two, three, likewise, there are a series of workshops, worldwide congresses were held. But no longer the Heliika of Ahamijara, even for your lab studies, you cannot find it in the field these days from cotton. So all these are possible because of the simple molecular concept that there is a bacterium based in the Sturingiensis. They have the one delta endotoxin. This delta endotoxin is potentially effective against all lepidopteran insects. This concept was used and this Bt gene was integrated into the cotton and the cotton plants have been made as the factories for producing the insecticides. The plants that can synthesize their own insecticides, that is a concept. And every Bt plant itself is a insecticide producing, that is delta endotoxin producing factories. They keep the level of delta endotoxins in all the tissues and keep the bone worm under that check. That's a, if we say one great revolution of the embracing molecular science in entomology is Bt cotton for a long, long time. The science can revolutionize the pest management by reducing the insecticide load as well as sustaining the yield levels. So, likewise, over the years, we have been using them in a bits and pieces, different molecular tools, even though we are using. But in 2000, uh, Science Magazine, uh, they have grandly announced that human genome has been decoded. That was only the draft sequence. It took nearly the first time around more than uh, 22 years uh, to develop the draft genome. That time the technologies were not uh, that much uh, efficient. Even then it was heralded as a new initiative or a giant step in the molecular biology and biotechnological science. After the discovery of the DNA, the announcement of the human genome project was heralded as a, the biggest, biggest achievement by the mankind. But over the years, the technology has gone fast and with the help of the new generation sequencing technologies, now the pharmaceutical companies are collecting samples from human beings and these are all, all the samples collected from the different population for different reasons. And for all this population, the whole data of human genome is available. Now the entire human genome is decoded for producing the specific drugs. Many of the genetic disorders which are earlier shown cannot be cured. Now there is a way for finding out the drugs. And the gene therapy is also on the anvil. In another 20 years, the cancer and many other devastating diseases will be challenged by these strategies like gene therapy. All this is possible because of the complete sequencing of the human genome. And now the many companies by paying a good amount of dollars, you have your own human genome in capsule, it is ready. But what is needed better is the big data analytics are required to analyze whether there are any potential cause for concern or not. So in a way, anyway, the whole genome sequencing of the organisms have made a big say in the human welfare. It is interesting to note that the human genome project itself was possible. Anything they first they tried with the Drosophila. Initially, prelude to the human genome project, they first tried with the pet insect of the genetics, Drosophila melanogaster, and they completed the complete assembly of the Drosophila melanogaster. And whatever the analytic tools, how to analyze the genome assemblies and the development of software. The Drosophila Genome Project give way for the basic draft for the Human Genome Project itself. So that was a small beginning in 2004. Likewise, new versions of mobiles are released. Now, the extended version of the Drosophila Melanogaster was recently released in the year 2014, the version number 12. So likewise, newer versions come. Newer versions mean the genes are fully annotated and functionally characterized with the add-on features we can decipher more information from them. A casual search with the NCBA database shows last year's search 
there are 1219 insect genome you know, projects have been registered with the ncbi and the insect species are assembled in more than 29 insect orders to brush up all your information there are 29 known insect orders there is a recent addition one some scientists are also adding it among these most of these orders have been taken up for the analysis of the whole genome sequencing the more emphasis is given for the bugs the wasp and also the coleopterans and the, the lepidopteran moths so like the many genome projects are underway more than 1000 projects are underway there are great initiatives have been taken up like i5k i5k means 5000 major insects the whole genome have to be done because the insects are not only of the importance of the agriculture they have the bearing in a medical science also because they are acting as a disease vectors they are also used for applied significance especially in the pharmaceutical industry for drug designing they use many of the insect models so for using the modern insects also and many of our uh, physiological studies they use the insect genome as the model so for all these queries these insect genomics will have the answers first and foremost that concerns the human welfare are the vectors many different species of the mosquitoes are actually causing deaths just you see the number how many cases of malaria there 200 million cases of malaria reported and uh, six lakh people are uh, succumbing to the disease caused by different vectors transmitting malaria yellow fever dengue chicken gunia and others and others so first uh, the concern was we can address this issue by addressing the sequencing the genome of the different mosquito species the main reason being the complete analysis of the sequence of the mosquito genome will give way for identifying the different olfactory receptors so that will give way for developing a repellence like what of us is obsolete it's a product of more than 30 years old for the newer discoveries they are now analyzing the modern binding protein and the chemosensory genes of the mosquito and they do the drug designing with the normal repellence so that we can have a at least complete sleep the no home is free from mosquito at least we are using many different strategies every month we are spending, spending money on them here again the whole genome projects have answer in future for developing a normal repellence like we use different uh, mosquito repellence like a uh, heat many different we are using again we can develop a newer insecticide molecule all this is possible with the help of developing a information from the whole genome project and a new technique is also being this conditional lethal gene technique with this engineered mosquitoes have been released in australia and brazil to prove that this technique will also have the sustained control of the vectors and have a better human welfare so next one is the focus for agricultural pests initially much of this information for among the pests, Trigonium castanium insect was used as the model genome, and another insect, Acetocyphon physon, FA. These genome information have been used. How there are adaptations by the different symbionts in this organism, how different uh, insecticide resistant genes have been modulated in different species, base information were obtained from these species, and later on, this was extended to different beneficial insects as well. Likewise, we have the European consortium projects on the honeybee genome sequencing project. Similarly, another one, monarch butterfly. Where only doing the genome sequencing, they found out there are two different monarch butterflies are there. One is the migratory and another is a non-migratory. And their entire physiology is tuned in a different way in the migratory and the non-migratory. While the migratory have a slower metabolism to have a plate efficiency, it is a reverse in the non-migratory information was made possible by the genome sequencing projects of the monarch butterfly. Another devastating species is white fly. One day, the sequencing projects have been done for different biotype. In India, also we have completed on the Asia 2-1. So all these genome projects are aiming for 
identifying the new therapies or the new drug discoveries of the insecticide molecules. So over the years, when the genome databases are developed, many consortium or uh, group databases have also been developed. Initially, they started with a single insect like Except like and ants, likely there are different groups and consortiums are there. These consortiums are now collaborating different workers who are working on these genome projects and the data are shared. And one of the interesting databases is the insect base. This database is as of date, it is one of the comprehensive insect genome database wherein we can retrieve the genome information of many different species and model analysis is also available in this. Again, once the, it's not end with the sequencing alone, there are challenges as well there. So there is a need for having a refined genome sequences and the rapid evolution of genome data, how we can use them functionally, it's a big challenge. <clears throat> the genome data is like a something ATGC, it's a molecular alphabet. Unless otherwise we decipher them with the functional characteristics, there is no use of this genome database. So there is a need for the function and analysis. For that, we need the basic workers, physiologists, ecologists, and their input is very much important for the functional characterization of the genes. So that is the greatest challenge. Here, genome sequencing alone will not give the answer. That means the other functional assays as well. So many of you have been uh, very much uh, Bombarded by different words, so a minute for silence. Many times silence will be a good day. So I will also observe silence for five seconds. Can you see also there is a change? Continuously by hearing uh, the decibels, you could see here a piece of mind. Similarly, when somebody is a uh, blasting you, moving away from the plants, silencing will be a better or sometimes we thought somebody is some silencer is needed. So silence is actually they say a gold. When words are silver, silence is called as a gold. In science also, science silencing is a really a big word. That is called the sound of silence. In what way we can silence them? If you know the technique, it will give a Great boom. Many times in science, the disorders occur. Many of the genes are behaving in an erratic way. Can you found the way for silencing them? So that started the science of silencing. So many different approaches were there. Initially, they thought there is an antisense is one approach. Normally, DNA is a transcript to RNA, RNA to protein. They thought we don't have to do with it in a reverse manner. We don't have to make antisense RNAs so that they can form the duplex formation and functional protein can be arrested. So that was the one approach they tried. Then during the course of that science, they found out there are many different uh, RNAs that are there in the cellular system. Cellus itself is a universe. We saw it's a single cell result with a different organelles. In the classroom, we will be studying with the rectangular uh, cell diagrams. We will be drawing with the different cell organelles. Invariably, our kids will put so many dots. So, like uh, stars in the universe, all these organs, RNAs, proteins, cell itself is a universe. There are different uh, RNAs like SIRNAs, microRNAs, microRNAs. They are doing a function. All these in a different way. So RNA machinery itself is a fantastic one. By going after this, they found out there is a particular mechanism called RNA interference. The functional transcribing of a gene can be arrested by help of this SARNA. This concept has been used and that way, it takes a 
have been developed. That is what is called the RNA, I, RNA, Interference Machinery Pest Management. So as of date, there is one formulation from uh, Syngenta. They have developed the CSRNA formulation, nano formulation against the double standard RNA of the potato leaf beetle. In Australia, there is a development for developing a nano formulation using this RNA technique against the white fly. So, many different companies are investing their money on the RNA. In our national front projects also, we are working on developing a nano formulation of the RNAI for silencing the table genes of the white fly for developing a variable nano formulation for white fly management. So the science is wide open for developing RNAI based health management. First I said silence, next is editing. In pictures also, you could see some of the pictures you see you cannot sit in the theater for four three hours nowadays uh, even kids are very restless because they say the picture is editing is poor likewise they are giving a command so editing gives a good shape to a picture same way in the genome of the editing is done by different organisms it's a kind of adaptive immunity in bacteria against viruses. apparatus for the multiplication of the viruses and this you know this one they found out a kind of adaptive immunity is there then during the course of these studies the investigation by 2012 uh, martin jinak and their co-workers that was a, a small beginning for understanding the guided dna endonucleases so later on a series of studies found out and that gives into the information like uh, CRISPR, CAS, all other terminologies have come into the forum. And now CRISPR, CAS is a kind of a familiar word. And now this has actually revolution. Within uh, 10 years, this concept of genome editing has been used in a big way. What is simply the genome editing? It is a technique to precisely and efficiently modify the DNA within the cell. It involves the use of the engineered nucleus, natural nucleases are there, but for our purposes, we can engineer the nucleases and we have to guide them to go to a particular site for which we are using the one guide RNA. So there will be, we will be using one specific nucleus, another one will be using a guided RNA to go to a target site. Combining these, we get the precise technique called a genome editing. And for me, the tool we are using is the CRISPR and CAS. With this, we can do a engineered nucleus that can cut the desired part of the DNA. And we can target the, this endonucleus towards our uh, gene of interest. And with the help of the guided RNA, the particular part of the DNA can be edited and the function can be altered. In a way, we will get the genome edited one. So it's a kind of a editing work that is occurring in the cell apparatus. This editing mechanism have now used as a tool, a potential tool as a genome editing of the organisms. So it has a wide opportunity for using this tool for getting dividends in many different sciences. Like earlier I said, using the human genome, we can find the new target. Same way now you are using the genome editing technique as a therapies or curative therapies for certain defective genes. Works are underway. Similarly, for medical entomology, they use the genome editing techniques for the stable control of the different species of the mosquito by different techniques, either through gene drive or through crispr cas system. We can develop engineered mosquitoes, and these engineered mosquitoes 
the males are released because males are actually harmless. Only females are the blood sucking ones. When it is entered into the system, they will develop the lethal offspring and that will again lead to a kind of a stable vector control. How it can be used in the agricultural ecosystem? Here we have to identify all along we have been working on the resistance. What are the factors that are contributing to the resistance? That the breeders like Vanirajan or other workers, they will be identifying them. They will be using this gene as a marker from the donor plant and they introduce them into the high yielding varieties and they develop a high yielding varieties with conferring resistance to a particular pest. Now the science of uh, crispr cas demands, you have to understand better about the susceptibility of the species. Identify the factors that are causing the susceptibility. If you knock out the susceptibility, if you identify the gene associated with them, then you lead the success. So likewise, this genome editing tool has been used for identifying the susceptible gene and where to do the knockout. There are specific protocols or crispr cas protocols of that. Using these by using a different markers, a change in foliage color. This foliage color change will give an indication that this plant is actually a genome edited plant. So by adding certain phenotypical markers, it can be done. Then the genome editing can be done in a such a way that plant volatiles are released in a different manner. So these plant volatiles will ripple the pest. So genome editing sky is the limit in the coming decades for using them in a big way for the stable management of the pests in the crop ecosystem. It has really transformed the agriculture in a big way. Herbicide resistance crops have been developed, soybean with the reduced trans phase. Even recently, potato, it is remained white always. It won't turn into brown. The melanin producing genes have been knocked out. So what it has having a that fat, white color or a flavored chips can be prepared. So likewise, there are many different uses, virus resistant cucumber, potatoes with altered starch content, high yield rice, gluten-free wheat, cancer treatment, farm animals with their resistance against different bacteria. So the, with the CRISPR identifying beginning of 2012, in, within uh, eight years, it has transformed the agriculture in a big way worldwide. So, Genome editing is a big one. It has come boom for the agriculture. Many different countries, because it's not a genetically modified organism. We are just altering them using that within that, you know, there is no exotic gene is introduced like a transgenic crops. So in many countries, they have been labeled as a not genetically modified. So genome, genome editing techniques, have been given a green signal. So in some of them are in the orange, some of them are still red. So likewise, the policy guidelines are also changing. So with these change guidelines, the genome editing has been potentially used as a potential tool for transforming the agriculture. So, so far I covered a brief introduction about the molecular tools, next to the genome, then RNAi, then Genome editing now comes to the lab. Maybe you may be feeling an uh, appetite now. now tea and snacks are being served here. I hope that you are getting a computer as well. So your gut sensor said when you are getting bored somewhere, then your gut will be sensing this. Your intestine, you need something appetite is needed. This appetite it was called uh, there is a it's a kind of a nature once the gut is empty actually they are giving a signal but uh, now science says not only our system there are many bacteria that are residing inside our body the same thing holds good for every human being here or any organism we are not a single genome of a we are not a single genome of homo sapiens. Everyone is embedded with the genome of millions of micro bacteria. They are all residing. Without this bacteria, we will be nonsense. Unless these beneficial bacteria are there in the gut, entire digestion will be 
disrupted. That's why many times when those having a dysentery or other, after recovering, naturally they give the probiotics. These probiotics are nothing but the healthier beneficial bacteria that actually improve the health. Now the science have grown in a big way. There is a grand world of microbiome. This microbial research have been used for reducing the stress. If somebody is feeling stress, they identify there are certain bacteria associated with them. When someone's having appetite, there is a problem. You have to address your gut microbiome. For infants, if a lactase intolerance or anything, you have to look for the lactose producing bacteria. Likewise, obesity are many different factors. Now they are attributing to the microbiome and the microbiome therapy has come. Many of the cancers are colon cancer or the stomach related cancer earlier have been addressed by the surgeries. Now they have been addressed by the microbiome therapy. So it's, these are all only the visible organs. The invisible organs are the microbiome. Only with the microbiome, a man will be a normal functioning body. So nearly when the body cells are uh, 10 power 4 or anything, the microbiomes are nearly having a 9 million genes. So that is the power of the microbiome. And they have actually transformed the whole science of the human welfare. Insect is only a single species. Say, take the case of insects. That is the diversity. They have a different uh, adaptations. One is feeding only on honey, another on the bees, another on the tree trunks uh, taking the juices, another is a sucking pest. So if we take the diversity of the insects, their intestine is also modified. And that goes that diversity of the microbe. If there is a diversity, insects are the largest uh, inhabiting organisms in the world. See the diversity of the microbiome in fold. I can't imagine how many trillion or zillion microbes there in the whole insect world. So likewise, insects have a lot associated with the microbe. Many different microbes have been identified with the recent tools. And these tools have given a new insight into the insect-plant interaction. Earlier, they were thought it's only that insects and plants are interacting, favorable and unfavorable signals are given. Now, the recent study shows that the microbiome also induces certain volatiles. So they are called as a volatile organic compounds. The microbiome induces the volatile organic compounds. By simply engineering the microbiome of the plants, we can give the repellent signal or attraction signal in a different way. So from the insect body, they identify different microbiome, and these microbiomes have been developed, used for developing the improved fruit like traps. Keep these microbial uh, derived volatiles in the form of the lure. Put them in the traps, we can attract the insects that are away from the field. Same way, traps have been developed for different insects. So in our lab also, we have found out that there are different uh, insecticide resistance can be associated with the microbes in a different way. Different symbionts are associated. In rice also, earlier they found the resistant varieties is broken down when newer forms of the biotypes have been developed. Again, here the science says you should not bother only about the biotype, should also bother about the yeast like endosymbionts in the VPH. When we have the information on these symbionts as well, we can develop the ways for break down their association with the insect, and that way we can manage the pest. So there are endless cases, microbial studies in the honeybees actually help to develop a better probiotics. And these probiotics, we have, our studies show we have identified a number of isolates from the different honeybee species. Using the enzyme assays, we have found out which of them are having the beneficial effects. We can use them as a probiotic even for disease tolerance. Same way in silkworm, especially in Northeast, our studies we have done with the Muga silkworm. We developed the consortium and found they are having the good cellulonetic activity. This we developed as a probiotic consortium. And by using this metagenomic approaches and others, we identify what are these isolates having the cellular genetic activity. We develop a formulation 
and it was tested down and it proved it is having the better cell form being there. So, symptomatic pest control. In human welfare, also earlier for uh, diseases like uh, filariasis are treated with the uh, anti helminthic tablet. Now, by giving an antibiotic, the associated symbiotic can be killed. In India, also there is a Melinda Gate Foundation sponsored work is going on by studying the microbiome of the fly associated with the colour or a sand fly, so that there will be cure for colour So this microbiome research having a lot of implications for human welfare. They can be used for a biofuel in insects like a scarabid and a termites. They are doing a lot of bioprocessing so that they can be used as a for future production of ethanol production, this microbiome can be engineered. There are a number of industrial users of that, like uh, tanning of leather or food dairy products, cosmetic tea processing. In many of these, it's the beneficial microbes are used. A number of products are there in the market internationally. So we can also harness the potential of the microbiome in a big way. So now I almost come to the end of this lecture. This is the moment you are all looking for. So I'm summarizing all these things that really this molecular entomology have widened the horizon of the pest management, starting from the nano formulation of the RNAi. <coughs> the coming days are really great prospects of that for agriculture in the form of designer crops. Then for human welfare also, insect-based probiotics are available. Microbiome in the field can be engineered, microbiome engineering. Likewise, the genomic approaches holds promise for a sustainable pest control. So thank you all for the patient listening. I take this moment for acknowledging the ones who have really contributed for the development of the science. My institute, IRA, which has provided a platform for doing this research. And before that, my elder of the team, I know this institute only have shaped my career as well as not only our idea is important, the funding agencies are far more important. With the help of the collaborators from the different institutes, we could harness funds from ICR National Fund, DBT, DSD, International Grand Channel Program from Australia, National B Board. And I have the support of all the research collaborators, scholars. And last but not the least, my dear students, they have been my guiding force as well there in conducting the research experiments in the laboratories. So all of them, I say a big word, thank you. At this opportunity, I thank the Vice Chancellor of TNAU, Dean School of PG Studies for organizing this wonderful concept of endowment lecture series. I thank Dr. C. Vanya Rajan, Dean of ADAC and RA, Teacher of Paddi, Dr. Ambedkar, Head Division of Entomology, and my dear colleagues here at uh, the Agriculture College and Research Institute, Trichery, and for all the audience on and off the dais, also on the online and offline. I thank you all for the patient listening. Thank you. Question uh, any interactions? Now in the ICA, we are writing the students there and the MSC they are feeling for PhD. Okay. And uh, I are is there any change now uh, in PhD admission pattern? Yeah, good question. Until a few years back, IRA conducts a separate uh, examination for the MSc as well as the PhD entrance examinations. A uh, few years back, only for the uh, MSc they are taking the candidates who are qualified for the JR. For the last three years, there is no separate entrance examination for IARA. Those who are clearing the junior research fellowship or research fellowship, 
they can go for counseling and use ira also as the one of the centers so if we excel in ira if we excel in the joint uh, junior research fellowship or senior research fellowship you can guarantee the seat at ira because it's all based on counseling so as per the students convenience and preference now they are choosing that one again our syllabus is also has been changed for the last three years we are also following the same icr syllabus for both the pg as well as postgraduate msc as well as the phd from this year onwards ira is also starting undergraduate program in agriculture horticulture biotechnology engineering and community science in all these science at ira new delhi ranchi and assam campuses this undergraduate program also starting from the year 22 to 23 so ours is not a single institute offering window for a one institute or anything ours is a national institute over of clearing the national jrf exam or srf exam as per the merit order as per their counseling one they can get the seat there but for me, we have to prepare the studiously the syllabus of the JRF and the SRF examination for all the disciplines concerned. We don't have a specific syllabus for any IRA entrance examination. No interviews conducted at IRA. Until four years back, we have been conducting interviews also after the examination. No more interviews. Straight after the examination, the candidate can go for counseling. They can choose IRA also as one of the options, including other state agriculture universities as per their choice. So, yes. Just before that, now I just want to add, now we have nearly 70 students from Tamil Nadu from different campuses are studying a postgraduate and a PhD programs. I have not included the admission this year. Our current state up to the 21-22 is more than 76 students are doing in different disciplines. So this year it may cross 100 people. Yes. Thank you for Thank it. you. Thank you for an excellent presentation, sir. So one question. So other than the BT uh, content, is there any other uh, other uh, successive achievement um, in genome approach uh, of risk management, sir? There are many studies, but because of our regulatory guidelines and others, even in uh, India, including TNA, we have successfully demonstrated about the BT Prinjal. Not only the bacillus transgenics, these transgenics have been done in many different crops uh, worldwide. Canola, in many crops we can cite soybean. Worldwide, there are many successes. But in India, due to the regulatory guidelines, as of now, we have only BT cotton. Next, this year, they have given the clearance for the field trials for the genetically engineered mustard. The trials are underway. So they have given a provisional uh, approval by the GEC for the four years for conducting the trials. Thank you. Thank you. Very good lecture. I have a question, sir. Yes. In case of genome editing, should we unravel the entire genome or a particular gene that is coding for the sequence? You have to look for anything functional. As I said, if your interest is only for the test, you have to look for the susceptibility. Likewise, they are using a different one. Recently also, they have identified genome editing works in RISE is initiated in the NAPGR and other institutes looking for certain yield attributing factors. So likewise, it depends on your functional trait, whether it's a quality improvement also, genome editing has the answer. Second question is on the project on Mugasin, about yes. So is there any formulated project or formulation that is available, sir? Actually, it is only we developed that it's being done at the, there is a central Muga on Eri Silk Research Institute at Jorat. We have uh, jointly developed a probiotic combination that they have to use that the TMERT chloride. Not a commercial product is not the institute level combinations are there. Thank you. Any online queries? Subramanian? Yes, I could not see you. Yeah, this is Ramalingam.
Yes. Yeah, it's a very wonderful lecture, Subramanian. Thank you. Um, any progress on uh, sequence based uh, insecticide development at IRI? Not insecticide development. We can use this for uh, developing uh, attractant or repellent for white flies using the genomic database of white flies. We are trying to do develop. Uh, Attractant as well as the repellent based on the information or the sequence based information of the odorant binding protein and the chemosensory genes of white flies. That's an underway. Okay, okay. fine. G, 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 G. Good afternoon, Dr. Uh, nice to see you, Johnson. Uh, uh, I have a basic doubt. You have told you about uh, RNA IE nano formulation, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so, what is its impact on non target organisms? As usual, for any studies, we have to do for the regulatory studies as well as. As of now, the studies show they don't have any non target effects because they are targeting only against the sucking pest. They are entirely different orders as that of the other biocontrol agents, which may be belonging to Hymenopteran and other orders. As of now, there is no non target effects toward these beneficial natural enemies. Okay, that's all from thank you thank you camera mati 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 who are assembled offline as well as online. Now it is the time to say my gratitude. I take this opportunity as a special privilege to propose the apartment. What of thanks for this wonderful event that is uh, being finished in a very successful manner. At the outset, we yeah. are extremely grateful and thankful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. B. Gita Lakshmi, who had always been encouraging us. And she is like the Kumalo Nimbus Cloud because she always keep all the top Nimbus scientists, etc., in a cloud line. So that is uh, our feature of uh, his personality, ma'am. We are very grateful to you. Although you have not connected to us, you are well wishes will always revolve in it. Thank you very much for your grace. And uh, we are also very much uh, grateful to Dr. Yen Sendil, the director of the CPMB, as well as the Dean PGS. Who is always very calm and uh, humble because he has a bundle of uh, knowledge. And uh, we are extremely happy, sir, to see you through online. Thank you very much for your wonderful arrangement because you are the instrumental for arranging this endowment lecture. And uh, I also very much thankful to. Our director CPBS, 
TNAU Coimbatore. Although she is not connected, we are thankful to ma'am for your encouragement. And uh, today's guest, Dr. S. Subramaniam, sir, we are very much thankful to you. He is also alumnus of our alma mater. And he has traveled a very long distance. And it's his turn. Step copying and schedule. And he is um, kind enough to come over from New Delhi to here to give this endowment lecture. Sir, we are very grateful to you, sir, for uh, rendering this service because this is an emerging trend in pest management. The genomic approaches in pest management. Really, your lecture today has thrown the empty number of lights to the, the budding entomologist who has uh, gathered across the TNAU institutions from Coimbatore, Madurai, Pilikulam, Trichadapuri in both the campus, and uh, across all institutions who are viewing this lecture. This is a really a wonderful. Uh, Brainstorm sessions to say, sir, we are very grateful to you for this wonderful lecture given to the benefit of the students, particularly the PG students of TNU. And again, we are very much thankful to our own dean, Dr. C. Vanya Rajan, because he is instrumental right from the beginning. He has planned meticulously to arrange these functions and made it uh, possible to be yeah, a successful event today. Sir, we are very much thankful to you. Again, our counterpart dean, Dr. T. Paramahuru, sir, the dean of XANRAW. So he has uh, given all kind of facilities and support and understand and cooperation for the successful conduct of this event, sir. We are very much thankful on behalf of the organizing committee. And again, so we are very much thankful to all of our university officers who are leaving this program through various campuses from the university and all HODs of this institution, both the institutions of ACNRA as well as ADHC and RA, staff members. The students faculty from PhD, PhD courses, as well as some of the UG students are also joined here. So holistically, I extend my thankfulness to all of you. I think you would have been sir, benefited out of this. Yes, uh, sir, <laughs> inoculated the proof. Like, shall I discard it? Because proof has been completely perfect. You take her permission and do that. Uh, or let her come back and do so it's already uh, full of water inside the box. <laughs> Shall I uh, show you? Yeah, bring it. Finally, okay. <laughs> finally, I thank my our own colleague, Dr. A. Kalyana Sundra, and Dr. Shiba Roslin, who has always uh, well planned to conclude this uh, program because the systematic. Uh, arrangements made in each and every point of uh, uh, even is uh, well appreciated. So I expect uh, this kind of cooperation in future also. So we are thankful to you all. And uh, finally, I thank all the audience who are uh, connected both offline and online. And uh, because the gathering, this audience gathering is uh, very much impressive. Not only this campus, many other campuses have rendered uh, to gather the audience uh, for the benefit of the holistic uh, this uh, endowment lecture, which was uh, which is really a wonderful event. I thank one and all for extending all cooperation in all walks of goods events to complete in a successful way. Thank you very much, Monica. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you